Hello. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. PJ. Dr. Mayang, kita bisa siap-siap. Hello, Dr. PJ. It's me, Mayang. Hi, Maya. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Dr. PJ. So we would like to start at one o'clock. Okay, I'm just going to try sharing my screen to make sure everything works. Yes, please. You can see that okay? Okay, how about to make it slideshow? Okay. Yes, nice. Okay. Okay. So we still have three minutes to go, Dr. PJ. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. PJ. Hi, very nice to meet you. It's Septian, mm -hmm. is that yes. correct? Yes, I'm Septian, Dr. <laughs> are you from, uh, are you now in uh, Jakarta or in Bangkok, actually? Right now I'm in Bangkok, um, and um, but I I'm from Canada McMaster University in Hamilton. Uh, yeah. Right now, in, landing to Bangkok. Sorry. Yes, I'm in beautiful Bangkok right now. So <laughs> it's, it's... Listen, so maybe you can join us in Indonesia, Bali, maybe. I would. I would love to. Week. I've never. I've never been to Indonesia. I'd love to come. Ah. Oh please! Okay, you should, you should go to Bali. We can we can invite him to Indonesia. <laughs> Not uh, yeah, well, everyone talks so much about Bali for sure. I'd love to see that, but I'd like to see Shakar. I'd like to see. It'd be very nice to see it. Of course, we love to. How many people live in Indonesia? What's the population? Uh, 170 million. 170 million? 200. Two, wow. <laughs> Maybe wow. more right now. It's a big population, though. Wow, I had no idea it was that big. That's huge. <laughs> that's really big. That is really big. So, fortunately, you are in Bangkok right now. Because yes. it... Whenever it's in Hamilton, it will be in the middle of the night, if I'm not yes. mistaken. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you, it's 1 a.m. right now in Hamilton. So I'm now on Thai time. I've made the switch. Okay. So it is already a long holiday in Hamilton, Dr. PJ? Or not yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, so like, um, I don't know. Let me just look here. Yeah, so Christmas Day is the 25th, which is Monday. So the holiday won't start until the Friday before. Oh, okay. In Canada, right now is uh, winter. It's winter for sure. It's not like here. <laughs> <laughs> What's the temperature in in uh, Hamilton up right now? And so it'll be like zero to five degrees. Uh, zero to zero five. Zero to five. <laughs> oh, in Indonesia, no. sometimes in the afternoon, uh, gonna be thirty eight to forty. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have two opposite problems. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sudah jam satu, already one o'clock, should we start? Yeah, yeah, that's okay, right, we start, yeah. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to live webinar of Paratin, namely evaluating cardiovascular uh, risk in non-cardiovascular surgery using biomarkers. First of all, I would like to greet our Honorable President of Indonesian Anesthesiology and Intensive Therapy, Irjen Paul Dr. Asep Hendradiana, Spesialis Anesthesiologi Terapi Intensif, 
Subspesialis Intensif Care Konsultan Ekes. Apa kabar dokter? Baik, alhamdulillah. Makasih dokter Maya. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. Okay, and also the Secretary of Perdatin, Dr. Ahmad Irfan, Spesialis Anestesiologi Terapi Intensif, Subspesialis Intensive Care Consultant. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Irfan. Yeah, Dok. Baik, and also our distinguished speakers, Dr. Philip James or Dr. PJ Devro, MD, PhD, FRCP. So, how are you, Dr. PJ? I am great. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Okay, nice to hear that. And also the second speaker, Dr. Dr. Septian Adi Permana, Spesialis Anesthesiologi Terapi Intensif, Subspesialis Intensive Care Consultant, MKES. So, Dr. Septian, apa kabar, dok? Alhamdulillah, terima kasih, Dr. Maya, Dr. Asad, Dr. Rifan, Dr. PJ. Yeah. And also our sponsor, uh, Ebert Products Indonesia, Mbak Feliciana Maya, as a marketing manager core diagnostic. Apa kabar Mbak Maya? Baik, Dr. Mayang. Terima kasih. Sudah menyambut dengan baik tamu-tamu kita. Terima kasih Mbak Maya. And also our lovely participants, ladies and gentlemen. So it's me, Mayang Indah Lestari. I'm an anesthesiologist and also intensivist at Muhammad Husin Palembang. And in this opportunity, I will be your moderator uh, in this live webinar. Okay, before we start, uh, let us hear the opening speech from President of Indonesian Association of Anesthesiology and Intensive Therapy or Pedatin to Dr. Asep Hendra Diana, Specialist Anesthesiology and Therapy Intensive, Subspecialist Intensive Care Consultant MKES. Time is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang, salam sejahtera untuk kita sekalian. Good afternoon. Untuk rekan-rekan sejawat, Bapak-Ibu sekalian yang saya hormati. Penyakit kardiovaskuler masih menjadi penyebab utama kematian di seluruh dunia. Dengan komplikasi yang sering muncul selama operasi yang tidak terkait. Hal ini menyebabkan kebutuhan mendesak akan tindakan penilaian resiko yang efektif untuk memastikan keselamatan pasien dan meningkatkan hasil pembedahan. Kita juga tahu bahwa biomarker adalah molekul biologis yang ditemukan dalam darah, cairan tubuh atau jaringan yang menandakan proses, kondisi atau penyakit yang normal atau tidak normal. Biomarker betina sebagai indikator kondisi fisiologis tubuh, membantu kita memahami dan memprediksi resiko kesehatan seperti kardiovaskular disease atau CVD secara lebih akurat. Dalam konteks pembedahan non-jantung, penggunaan biomarker memungkinkan kita untuk menilai resiko CPD pada pasien yang menjalani prosedur pembedahan yang tidak berhubungan dengan jantung. Hal ini sangat penting karena pembedahan meskipun diperlukan dapat membebani sistem kardiovaskuler yang berpotensi memicu atau memperburuk kondisi jantung yang sudah ada. Ada beberapa biomarker yang penting dalam konteks ini. Sebagai contoh, biomarker troponin Protein yang ditemukan dalam otot jantung yang dilepaskan ke dalam aliran darah ketika terjadi kerusakan pada jantung. Peningkatan kadar troponin dapat mengindikasikan resiko CVD yang lebih tinggi. Atau juga beberapa biomarker yang lain seperti B-type, natriuretic, peptide, dan yang lainnya. Yang dengan memantau biomarker ini sebelum dan sesudah operasi, kami dapat membantu memprediksi dan mencegah komplikasi jantung pada pasien yang menjalani operasi non-jantung. Namun demikian, penggunaan biomarker dalam penilaian resiko CVD bukannya tanpa tantangan. Faktor-faktor seperti usia, jenis kelamin, kondisi medis yang menyertai dapat mempengaruhi kadar biomarker sehingga mempersulit interpretasinya. Oleh karena itu, sangat penting bagi kita untuk terus menyempurnakan pemahaman dan penerapan indikator-indikator tersebut. Kesimpulannya, Pemanfaatan biomarker dalam memahami resiko CVD pada 
bedah non jantung telah membuka jalan baru untuk meningkatkan keselamatan bedah, perawatan pasien, dan hasil secara keseluruhan. Jalan ke depan melibatkan penelitian, validasi, dan penerapan biomarker ini secara terus akan mengoptimalkan perawatan bedah. Webinar kali ini akan membahas tuntas mengenai peran biomarker untuk evaluasi resiko CVD pada operasi non kardiak. Dalam kesempatan ini, kami mengucapkan terima kasih kepada PT Ebet Produk Indonesia yang mensupport webinar ini, juga kepada kedua pembicara dan moderator, dan juga telah berkenan mengisi webinar ini. On this occasion, I would like to take this opportunity to express my special thanks to Dr. Philip James Dever for being a speaker to at today's webinar. Hopefully, we can continue to work together on insight scientific activity in future. Semoga bermanfaat untuk kita sekalian. Demikian, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much for uh, the speech, Dr. Asep. Okay, let's get start to our presentation session. For information, our presentation session will be divided into three parts. First one is the material presentation. Second one is discussion. And also the last is uh, closing remarks. So as a note, please write your question or comments on the chat column, right? So before we start, I'd like to read a brief introduction for our speakers. The first one is Dr. Philip James Devereaux, MD, PhD, FRCP, consultant cardio cardiologist. So Dr. Devereaux, or Dr. PJ is a cardiologist and also clinical epidemiologist and perioperative care physician. He is a professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Cardiology, and also professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, uh, Evidence and Impact, or HEI, at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, I can read there are almost 300 pages of CV, but I'm trying to make it short, that Dr. PJ conducts many research, and one of them is uh, focused on perioperative vascular events in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And there are so many awards, grants, and also publication, which of of course, I cannot tell one by one. one, by one. And for our uh, second speaker, Dr. Dr. Septian Adi Permana, specialist anesthesi anesthesiology therapy intensive, subspecialist intensive care consultant, MKES. So Dr. Septian is our consultant of anesthesiologist and intensivist at Dr. Muwardi Hospital, Surakarta. Now he is the head of emergency room at uh, Mawardi Hospital. So, Dr. Septian uh, has graduated from Universitas 11 Maret for his doctoral program and also his anesthesiology and MD. Uh, he got his consultant degree of intensive care at Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia. Uh, from his CV, we can uh, infer that there are many research, many publication and books that Dr. Septian has. So without uh, further ado, let's just start to our uh, core, which is the presentation. So welcoming our speaker number one, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to welcome Dr. Dr. Septian Adi Permana to present his material about report of postmyocardial infarction in non-cardiac surgery in Indonesia. So you have 30 minutes for the presentation, Dr. Septian, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Maya. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. PJ, Dr. Asep, Dr. Irfan, and about him. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, let me 
ask for uh, permission to present my presentation in uh, bahasa Indonesia. Yes, I completely understand. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay. Yes. Uh, myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. Ini uh, merupakan salah satu hal yang seringkali kita hadapi bagi seorang dokter anestesiologis. Dan bagaimana latar belakangnya Ternyata memang dari penelitian didapatkan penelitian yang pertama yang dilakukan oleh Ecotsi uh, dari 40 ribu pasien ternyata ditemukan 7 persen diantaranya mengalami uh, myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery. Kemudian penelitian berikutnya yang dipublis di JAMA uh, ditemukan dari 3.904 pasien terdapat 18 persen Uh, daripadanya mengalami means in myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery. Precise incident daripada myocardial injury itu cukup cukup beragam, baik di masing-masing daerah dan uh, negara seperti itu. Lantas bagaimana ketika uh, PM ini atau post myocardial injury uh, post operative myocardial injury pada Southeast Asian dari ASEAN? Kami mendapatkan dua publikasi. Yang pertama dari uh, Vietnam didapatkan dari 1.466 pasien yang mengalami PMI sekitar 0,12 persen. Dan juga kami dapatkan juga di tahun 2010 itu di Thailand uh, didapatkan angka kejadiannya berbeda yaitu 7,5 persen. Dan ini menunjukkan bahwa ini memang cukup bervariasi antar negara seperti itu atau antar daerah. Dan bagaimana sih uh, patofisiologi mekanismenya? Sebenarnya patofisiologi mekanismenya dipengaruhi oleh beberapa faktor. Yang pertama adalah dari surgical atau traumanya itu sendiri, kemudian uh, kejadian yang terjadi hemodinamiknya selama operasi, baik itu hipertensi, hipotensi, anemia, uh, dan juga Comorbid disease yang terjadi sebelum operasi itu sendiri, dan hal tersebut akan menyebabkan ketiganya akan menyebabkan terjadinya uh, means ini myocardial injury after non cardiac surgery. Terus uh, apa sih bedanya antara injury, iskemi maupun infarct? Di sini ada tiga hal yang uh, sedikit berbeda tetapi mengarah pada satu hal yang sama yaitu infarct. Yang pertama kita bahas ada tentang myocardial injury. Apa sih yang dimaksud dengan myocardial injury? Myocardial injury ini adalah uh, kematian daripada sel jantung yang ditandai dengan peningkatan kardiak troponin. Tetapi peningkatannya ini tidak selalu berasosiasi dengan gejala iskemi. Jadi kalau tanpa gejala tapi kardiak troponinnya naik Nah, ini disebut myocardial injury. Nah, sedangkan kalau myocardial ischemia itu bagaimana? Myocardial ischemia adalah penurunan perfusi ke jantung dan juga penurunan perfu, uh, oksigenasi ke sel jantung yang mungkin disebabkan karena obstruksi daripada blood vessel. Dan hal tersebut akan menyebabkan terjadinya myocardial infarct. Jadi kedua hal ini ketika bertemu akan menyebabkan myocardial infarct di mana Myocardial infarct adalah myocardial injury yang ditandai ditambah dengan tanda-tanda adanya akut iskemia. Jadi gejalanya simptom itu mungkin muncul. Nah, lantas tadi ada istilah tentang PMI dan juga atas uh, istilah tentang MINS gitu ya. PMI bukan palang merah Indonesia, tapi PMI adalah perioperatif myocardial injury yang ditandai dengan peningkatan kadar Troponin tanpa disertai di sini tanpa disertai simptom yang muncul. Jadi kayak myocardial injury tadi ya, bahwa PMI adalah perioperatif myocardial injury peningkatan terjadinya uh, elevasi daripada kardiak troponin tanpa disertai simptom. Sedangkan kalau mins ini adalah myocardial 
infection yang ditambahi dengan sim simptom yang terjadi. Meskipun sayangnya pada pasca operasi atau durante operasi, simptom itu bisa terbiaskan oleh anestesi dan juga analgesi yang kita berikan. Ini kriteria daripada MINS. Pertama adalah clinical symptom. Jadi clinical symptom ini harusnya ada. Sayangnya terkadang tertutupi oleh sedasi maupun uh, analgesi yang kita berikan. Kemudian onsetnya. Onsetnya sampai 30 hari pasca surgery. Jadi memang agak cukup lama ini MINS. Ini. Jadi meskipun operasi hari ini, terus 27 hari lagi dia mengalami peningkatan kardiak uh, troponin, dan juga adanya clinical symptom, ini masih dianggap sebagai MINS. Terus kemudian yang ketiga adalah peningkatan biomarker, yaitu kardiotroponin lebih dari sama dengan satu. Kemudian dieksklusikan penyebab non-iskemik. Jadi peningkatan kardiotroponin yang non-iskemik, seperti contoh, mungkin bisa disebabkan karena uh, pulmonary emboli, kemudian CHF, gitu ya, kardiak, uh, heart failure, dan lain sebagainya. Itu uh, mengeksklusi dari kriteria MINS ini. Dan bagaimana dengan PMI? PMI gejalanya seperti yang tadi kami sampaikan bahwa hanya kriterianya berdasarkan onset, yaitu pasca operasi atau perioperasi, dan juga peningkatan biomarker kardiak troponin tanpa harus melihat clinical symptom. Terus bagaimana pengaruh jenis surgery terhadap kejadian PMI? Dari penelitian di tahun 2021 dari Frontier, dari Mei Han Pui, ditemukan bahwa paling sering terjadinya myocardial infection pada pasien-pasien yang dilakukan vascular surgery, yaitu 2,3 persen. Terus bagaimana uh, manajemennya? manajemen pada pasien ini gitu ya. Yang pertama sebelum kita berpikir tentang manajemen kita lihat dulu risk faktornya apa aja. Pertama usia tua, kemudian jenis kelamin laki-laki, kemudian adanya comorbidity berupa aterosklerosis associated, contoh hipotensi, diabetes, CAD, PAD, dan juga CVE. Kemudian uh, adakah kondisi kardiovaskuler lainnya seperti heart failure, kemudian atrial fibrilasi dan juga comorbidity lain seperti CKD dan juga ini yang paling sering kita lihat ya adalah uh, peningkatan daripada RCRI atau Revised Cardiac Risk Index Score. Di samping itu high risk top bank risk score yang sering kali kita lihat uh, ada kaosa, kemudian obesitas dan lain sebagainya. Ini juga merupakan salah satu faktor risiko terjadinya MINS. Seperti kita tahu, obesitas merupakan memang salah satu faktor risiko daripada infarkt myokard. Terus, kemudian, apa sih postoperatif test risk faktor yang bisa ada? Jadi, apakah hanya yang preoperatif aja? Ternyata tidak. Ternyata postoperatif pun juga akan beresiko terjadinya MINS ini, atau PMI. Itu postoperatif bleeding, sepsis, hipoksia, takikardi, hipotensia, dan juga severe anemia. Dari penelitian Lingenhaug Gal ditemukan bahwa resiko PMI akan meningkat 1,46 kali untuk setiap penurunan eh, HB di bawah 10 gram per desiliter. Dan itu perlunya eh, transfusi secara bijaksana. Terus kemudian screening yang bisa kita lakukan. Screeningnya apa sih gitu ya? Kita biasanya kita gunakan screening dengan uh, revised cardiac risk index gitu ya. Terus atau yang lain adalah dengan Gupta perioperatif risk for myocardiac infarct Mika score. Jadi ini dua dua scoring yang seringkali kita gunakan ya untuk uh, menilai oh ini pasien akan beresiko terhadap terjadinya PMI atau uh, MINS atau enggak nanti pasca operasi. Seringkali kita konsul jantung nanti akan dijawab RCRI uh, resiko apa seperti itu ya. Nah. 
Revised Cardiac Risk Index ini terdiri dari 5 clinical risk factor disertai 1 surgical risk factor. Ini teman-teman pasti sudah paham. Uh, clinical risk factor-nya apa aja? 1. CVA, Cerebrovascular Disease, CHF, Creatine level, uh, level yang lebih dari 2, DM yang dengan disertai uh, kebutuhan terhadap insulin, kemudian ischemic cardiac disease sebelumnya, dan satu surgical faktor yaitu jenis operasinya apa? Vaskular kah? Intratural kah? Atau intraabdominal? Nah, di sini yang cukup menarik adalah angkanya ketika paling tinggi, scoring paling tinggi adalah di atas 3, maka resikonya itu di atas 11. Ini sebenarnya masih cukup kecil ya, karena mungkin uh, penelitiannya belum cukup banyak. Ber, uh, mungkin akan ada bisa dilakukan penelitian dikombinasikan dengan kardiak troponin seperti itu, sehingga angka ini mungkin akan bisa lebih tinggi. 0 berapa, 1 berapa, 2 berapa, 3 berapa, 4 berapa, 5 berapa, dan 6 berapa. Kalau 6-6-nya ada, berapa sih resikonya? Mungkin akan bisa lebih jelas ketika nanti dikombinasi dengan kardiak troponin seperti itu penelitiannya. Nah, berikutnya adalah tentang Gupta Perioperatif Risk uh, for Myocard Infarct. Ini yang dinilai agak berbeda dengan RCRI. Yang dinilai adalah satu, usia. Kedua, fungsional statusnya. Yang ketiga, ini asa. Ini asa kita ini masuk di sini. Asa kita, fisikal uh, status dari asa masuk ke dalam Gupta Perioperatif Risk for Myocardial Infarct. Kemudian kreatinin juga masuk dan juga yang terakhir adalah type of prosedur. Nah, sayangnya di sini ini ini ketika dibandingkan gitu ya. RCRC dibandingkan Mika, di sana ada, ada perbedaan. RCRI cukup lebih banyak yang diakses dibandingkan Mika. Ini juga menjadi salah satu uh, mungkin bisa jadi kalau teman-teman ada yang mau penelitian lebih lanjut gitu ya. Kenapa nggak digabung aja sih RCRI di kombinasi dengan Mica nanti bisa dibandingkan gitu ya untuk uh, resiko terjadinya uh, presentase PMI atau uh, min tadi ya nanti dihubungkan dengan kardiak troponin mungkin akan lebih jelas mungkin scoring perdatin seperti itu ya jadi yang lebih jelas kemudian uh, durante operasi apakah berpengaruh terhadap kejadian PMI atau Mica ini ya min ini maaf ternyata iya dari penelitian oleh Fafi Salmasi tahun uh, 2017 ditemukan bahwa penurunan MAP kurang dari 65 dan penurunan MAP lebih dari sama dengan 30 persen dari baseline itu berhubungan terhadap terjadinya myocardial injury. Sedangkan ketika takikardi ini didapatkan dari penelitian Tussler di tahun 2019 ditemukan bahwa uh, peningkatan heart rate durante operasi lebih dari 90 atau lebih dari 100 kali per menit tidak berhubungan dengan kejadian myocardial injury meskipun ini membutuhkan penelitian yang lebih lanjut bagaimana dengan data-data uh, guideline yang ada di Indonesia Indonesia kebetulan belum memiliki national guideline berkenaan tentang uh, mins dan juga PMI ini Uh, dan cukup bervariasi penata laksanaan maupun um, screening toolsnya uh, untuk PMI dan juga MINS ini. Jadi uh, seperti kita tahu bahwa kita memiliki uh, national insurance yang nanti akan membedakan uh, rumah sakit tipe rumah sakit. Jadi kemampuan tipe rumah sakit itu akan berbeda. Bayangkan ketika rumah sakit tipe D, dia harus di harus menggunakan kardiak troponin sebagai markernya, maka kami kira uh, klaimnya tidak akan cukup seperti itu untuk untuk uh, operasi gitu ya. Nah inilah yang mungkin uh, mendorong teman-teman mungkin dari perdatin untuk uh, mengkomunikasikan lebih lebih lanjut seperti itu ya untuk kemungkinan untuk memungkinkan screening yang lebih baik dengan kardiak troponin karena seperti kita tahu bahwa PM ini hanya dari kardiak troponin aja tanpa ada gejala. Jadi kalau harus menunggu gejala, maka ada kemungkinan e, cukup terlambat seperti itu ya untuk mengetahui adanya PMI. Begitu juga dengan data yang ada di Indonesia. Kebetulan bank data yang ada di Indonesia belum terkumpul secara menyeluruh dan kami sudah searching di 
jurnal di Indonesia belum ada tentang uh, report of post myocardial infarct. Untuk itu kami men- mencoba mencari data yang ada di rumah sakit kami selama satu tahun. Ini masih cukup bervariasi ya antara rumah sakit tipe A, rumah sakit tipe D, kemampuan um, bahkan labnya aja tidak semuanya memiliki yang untuk memeriksa kardiak troponin seperti itu. Jadi memang masih uh, cukup bervariasi antar uh, hospital. Ini dari data kami pasien karakteristik dari Januari 2023 sampai Desember di 2023 di minggu kemarin. Kami temukan pasien dengan uh, RCRI lebih dari dua, yaitu ada 1.055 pasien. Cukup banyak. Dari baru satu tahun ya. Terus dari yang RCRI lebih dari dua, ternyata hanya 13 pasien yang mengalami uh, MINS. Ya, MINS. MINS atau PMI ini ya. Dia onsetnya 3-5 hari pasca operasi, terus terjadi peningkatan biomarket kardiak troponin. Terus kemudian masuk intensif care unit. Ini kenapa? Ini bukan PMI tapi MINS ya. E, karena memang di kami karena memang belum jadi guideline ya bahwa pasien preoperatif harus kita cek kardiak troponin dan pasca operasinya juga kita harus cek kardiak troponin sehingga kami akan mengecek kardiak troponin ketika pasien itu ada sintem. Nah, MINS-nya yang terjadi adalah sekitar 1,23 persen. Cukup. Uh, banyak jika dibandingkan dengan Vietnam, tapi cukup rendah bila dibandingkan dengan Thailand yang dari data uh, ASEAN tadi. Karakteristik pasien dari yang ke-13 pasien mengalami MINS tadi, jenis uh, surgery-nya, 10-nya elektif, 3-nya emergency, gender-nya memang sesuai dengan uh, teori, yaitu male-nya lebih banyak, yaitu usia, eh, apa, uh, jenis kelamin laki-laki, Dengan usia juga lebih banyak pada usia geriatri, yaitu 9 orang, 69 persen, gitu ya, hampir 70 adalah geriatri. Terus kemudian dengan status fisik sama seperti yang di scoring daripada Gupta, ya, yaitu uh, asanya 3 paling banyak, yaitu 76,9 persen. Dan sayangnya outcome-nya juga yang meninggal cukup banyak, yaitu 76,9 persen dibandingkan yang lain. Karena kami memang menunggu simptomnya ini yang jadi masalah. Terus kemudian, atherosclerosis associated comorbidity. Kami bagi berdasarkan uh, faktor resiko atherosclerosisnya, hipertensi, diabetes, DVT, CAD, CVD, maupun PAD. Ternyata yang paling banyak adalah dari uh, hipertensi. Dan terjadi pada, di sini ASA ya, klasifikasi ASA, ASA 3. Kemudian uh, RCRI berdasarkan dari RCRI skor yang paling banyak adalah yang scoringnya 3 di atas 3 ini. Di atas 3 ini biru 46% memang jadi memang angka kejadiannya paling banyak ya, 11. Kalau di sini disebutkan adalah 11%. Di kami ternyata hanya 1,27%. Terus eh, bagaimana hubungan antara peningkatan kardiak troponin setelah non kardiak surgery dihubungkan dengan RCRI? Ternyata memang benar peningkatan paling tinggi di sini adalah RCRI skor ya. Di sini ada eh, sorry ini kardiak troponinnya ini di bawah 20.000, ribu, 20 ribu sampai 40 di atas 40.000 ribu. Di sini RCRI skornya ternyata memang paling banyak adalah yang di atas 40.000 dengan scoring 3. RCRI, RCRI, RCRI skornya 3, kardiak troponinnya memang tinggi gitu ya, di atas 40.000. Terus eh kejadian MINS berdasarkan tipe daripada surgery-nya ternyata sesuai dengan eh, penelitian sebelumnya yaitu eh, vascular surgery. Dari 13 lima di antaranya adalah vascular surgery. Demikian uh, presentasi dari kami. Waktu dan tepat kami kembalikan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much for uh, such informative presentation, Dr. Septian. Now we can keep uh, 
the questions maybe all the participants have questions about the incidence of post myocardial infection uh, okay you can uh, write it down in the chat column so let's jump to our next presentation by dr pj Dr. PJ will present his presentation about the application of cardiac biomarkers in non-cardiac surgery. So, Dr. PJ, your time is 30 minutes, please. Thank you so much. If I talk too fast or anything is unclear, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask me to repeat something. So, I'm expected as part of our university policy to put up my disclosures. Um, what you need to know is that I have originated many questions and written many grants that have been funded by many different companies. Um, I'll spend a lot of time talking about the Vision study. And Vision had over 70 funding sources internationally. Vision was a 40,000 patient prospective cohort study. And we wrote a lot of grants to get it funded, but we did receive some financial support from Abbott and Roche and some biomarkers from both Abbott and Roche and also Siemens. So the goal of the presentation is I first want to talk about what is unique about non-cardiac surgery and why we see complications in the cardiovascular system in this setting. And then I want to talk about the potential role of cardiac biomarkers before non-cardiac surgery to improve risk prediction and after non-cardiac surgery to avoid missing prognostically important myocardial injury. Two factors will determine whether our patients will suffer a perioperative cardiovascular complication. The first is the physiological stress associated with the surgery. And the second is the patient's underlying vascular disease state. So I'll take both these points in order. When we think about non-cardiac surgery, um, there is no doubt people benefit from non-cardiac surgery. Sometimes it cures cancer. Sometimes it can dramatically improve quality of life with a new hip or knee, as an example. But despite the benefits of surgery, surgery initiates inflammatory, hypercoagulable stress, catabolic, and bleeding states that can precipitate cardiovascular complications. And then when you put these physiological states that are very, that create the perfect milieu for causing vascular events into a patient who has underlying vascular disease, that's when you're very susceptible to the patient having a major cardiac event. So a large portion of adults undergoing non-cardiac surgery have the substrate, as an example, coronary artery disease, that puts them at risk of having cardiovascular complications. So one large um, administrative database study in the U.S., over 10 million U.S. citizens age 45 or greater, demonstrated that 50% had two or more cardiovascular risk factors and 25% had known atherosclerotic disease. So there's a lot of patients having major surgery um, on an annual basis that are vulnerable to this. And globally, there's over 300 million people having major surgery on an annual basis. When we think about preoperative cardiovascular risk assessment, I would advocate to you that it has many positive things that make it worthwhile. The first thing is that preoperative cardiovascular risk prediction can facilitate informed decision-making about the appropriateness of surgery. In other words, patients deserve not only to understand the benefits of surgery, they deserve to understand the risks so they can make an informed choice about whether surgery is appropriate for them. By having good risk estimation, it also helps us to identify at-risk patients to establish the appropriate surgical approach, laparoscopic, endoscopic, or open, or the anesthetic approach, general versus regional, or the post-operative surgical setting. Can the patient just go back to a surgical ward or do they need to go to a monitored ward? like a step-down unit or a critical care ward? Or does, and does the patient need post-operative monitoring with troponins and a shared care model with a perioperative care physician? 
Now, a lot of research has gone into various methods to predict preoperative cardiovascular risk. Four approaches have been evaluated. The first is clinical risk indices. So the most famous, as was mentioned earlier, will be the revised cardiac risk index. Um, the clinical risk indices in general, they have moderate prognosis moderate um, predictive performance. And where they tend to underperform is that they will tend to underestimate risk in a lot of patients that will suffer events because a lot of patients, when you ask them if they get chest pain or shortness of breath before surgery and they tell you no, the problem is many patients are not doing much activity. And so you can have a false sense of security that the patient doesn't have significant underlying cardiovascular disease because they're just not doing activity due to their underlying osteoarthritis or cancer or peripheral arterial disease. So because of the limitations of the clinical risk indices, people then did research on non-invasive cardiac tests like stress nuclear studies, um, coronary CT angiography. And in general, these tests improve risk prediction beyond the clinical risk indices, but the best research on these topics, um, on these tests, tend to show that they improve risk prediction amongst people that will have events, but they exaggerate risk in people that will not have events. And the overall net effect is putting more people in the wrong category of risk. So that's been a major limitation of the expensive non-invasive cardiac tests of stress echo, stress nuclear, and coronary CT angiography. Some people have then focused on um, looking at people's functional capacity. And in general, this has some uh, prognostic capability, but again, it has lots of limitation in terms of predicting cardiovascular risk. And because these other three approaches have real limitations, this has then brought some people to evaluate, could cardiac biomarkers improve our ability to predict perioperative cardiac risk? So this is a study led by Reitza Rodseth from South Africa. This was an individual patient data meta-analysis of just under 2,200 patients. And this demonstrates that preoperative NT ProBMP and BMP dramatically differentiate who is going to suffer a death or myocardial infarction within 30 days of non-cardiac surgery, such that if your NT ProBMP is less than 300 or BMP is less than 92, your risk of death or a myocardial infarction is 4.9%. But if your NT ProBMP is 300 or greater or BMP 92 or greater, your risk jumps up to 22%. And importantly, NT ProBMP not only improved risk prediction amongst patients who had events, it improved risk prediction amongst patients who did not have events. And the overall net reclassification, if you use NT ProBMP, beyond just a clinical risk index is that in a thousand patients, you will put another 155 patients in a more appropriate risk category. Encouraged by these results, we undertook a study called the Vision NT ProBMP study, and we published these results in the Annals of Internal Medicine a few years ago. This was a prospective cohort study of over 10,000 patients in 16 hospitals in nine countries. We measured NT ProBMP prior to surgery, and patients, healthcare providers, and study personnel were blinded to the preoperative NT ProBMP measurements. This shows you the results um, for the thresholds that we established through advanced statistical approaches for preoperative NT ProBMP. And as you can see here, preoperative NT ProBMP dramatically differentiates who will suffer major vascular events in the perioperative setting and total mortality such that for the composite of cardiovascular death and MINS, if your preoperative NT ProBMP is less than 100, your risk of this event is 5%. Versus if your preoperative NT ProBMP is, is greater than 1500, your probability of this event is 38%. And if you look at all cause mortality, if your preoperative NT ProBMP is less than 100, your risk of death is 0.3%, so three in a thousand patients. Whereas if your NT ProBMP is greater than 1500, 
you have a 4% probability of death, one in 25 of dying. These dramatically differentiate. And importantly, nt pro -BMP in the vision study, again, not only improved risk prediction amongst patients who would have events, it improved risk prediction amongst patients who would not have events. We then went on and did another sub-study in vision where we measured on, in just over 5,200 patients in nine centers in four countries, preoperative growth differential factor 15, GDF 15. Um, this is a novel marker of cardiovascular disease. And in this study, we blinded patients, healthcare providers, and study personnel to the preoperative GDF 15 measurement. This shows you the results for the various thresholds that we established with GDF 15. And again, what you see is that preoperative GDF 15 dramatically differentiates who will and who will not suffer a major perioperative cardiovascular complication. We published these results um, just this year in anesthesiology. What's important to keep in mind is that when you look at the results for NT pro BMP and GDF 15, they are very similar. They both strongly predict who will have events. And importantly, GDF 15 also improved risk prediction amongst patients who had events and improved risk prediction amongst patients who did not have events. There have been a number of studies looking at the prognostic capabilities of preoperative troponin. The most important ones is a prospective cohort study of just under 7,000 patients, which just demonstrated, and it was just published very recently, um, that preoperative high sense of troponin T values of 14 or greater were independently improved perioperative cardiovascular risk prediction beyond clinical variables. A limitation is that it didn't tell us established thresholds where we could really see the differentiation across risk categories with the preoperative high sense of troponin T. Retrospective cohort study of just over 12,000 patients demonstrated that high sense of troponin I values above the limit of detection but below the 99 percentile were associated with an increased risk of MINS and mortality. And based on these data, preoperative high sense of troponin provides independent prognostic information. So what can we take away from the preoperative biomarker data? Well, I will put forward to you that GDF-15 has comparable predictive capabilities to nt pro -BMP, but GDF-15 is not available in most hospitals, which then makes for a limitation that's just not applicable to a lot of clinical care. And although preoperative high sensitive troponin I or T measurements can facilitate rapid interpretation of a postoperative troponin value as acute or chronic, they cost less than the GDF-15 and nt pro -BMP, and they're available in most hospitals, the reality is we still have limited knowledge regarding the prognostication across the spectrum of preoperative troponin values, and we have data mainly from one assay that cannot be translated into another assay at this time. So based on these points, at present, clinicians can more accurately predict perioperative risk by measuring preoperative nt pro -BMP, which can be measured with point-of-care testing devices in preoperative clinics. And this is what we've done for many years in our hospital. Who said the following? The diagnosis of coronary artery occlusion following an operation is frequently difficult, since the very severe pain ordinarily associated with this condition may be absent. It was present in only 40% of cases. This disparity may be accounted for in part by the liberal use of narcotics and sedatives after operations. So if any of you thought it was me or anyone in our group who said it, we are flattered. But the reality is this was said back in 1938 publication by Master and colleagues published in JAMA. And Although this quote dates to eight decades ago, Masters' warning that perioperative myocardial infarction frequently goes unrecognized remains relevant today. And without postoperative troponin monitoring, two-thirds of myocardial infarctions and greater than 90% of MINs will go unrecognized. These show you the data from the vision study in the first 15,000 plus patients where we measured the non-high sensitive troponin T assay and looked to see the relationship between 
the peak troponin in the first three days after surgery, and the independent relationship to 30-day mortality. And as you can see here, there's a very striking dose response. As your troponin goes up, your risk of death dramatically starts to rise, such that if your peak troponin with a non-high sense of trope T is less than or equal to 0 0.01, your risk of death is 1% at 30 days. But if your peak troponin is even 0 0.03, it's now 9%. And if it's 0 0.3 or greater, it's now up to 16%. This is Dr. Fernando Boda, who is a cardiologist in Argentina. And Fernando did his master's with me. And when he was doing his master's, we developed the concept of myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, which we refer to as MIMS. Now, in vision, we undertook analyses where we evaluated patients who had an elevated troponin, and in vision, because labs said 0 0.04 or greater was abnormal, we were able to mandate that if patients had a troponin of 0 0.04 or greater, that patients would get ECGs and be assessed for ischemic symptoms. So we first had two independent reviewers evaluate each elevated troponin, and if they found there was any evidence of a non-ischemic etiology, like sepsis, rapid atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism, chronically elevated troponin, those cases were removed. We wanted to focus on elevated troponins that we thought were due to an ischemic etiology. And here what we did was we looked to see, okay, for the troponins that were elevated at 0.04 or greater, if they had a clinical feature of ischemia, that is ischemic symptoms or ischemic ECG changes, did those events alter the probability of death at 30 days? And as you can see here, they had an adjusted hazard ratio of 4.82, a result that is statistically significant. But most importantly, patients who had an elevated troponin of 0.04 or greater had no ischemic symptoms, no ischemic ECG changes. Those patients also had a very poor prognostic outlook. They had over a threefold increase in the probability they were going to die in a 30-day period. So these events, although asymptomatic, are not benign. So based upon this, we then realized there needed to be an outcome in the perioperative setting that was bigger than myocardial infarction. And we called this MINS. And MINS included myocardial infarction, but it also included isolated ischemic troponin elevations that occur within the first 30 days after surgery. MINS did not include non-ischemic myocardial injuries, such as, again, sepsis, rapid atrial fibrillation, pulmonary embolism, or chronically elevated troponin. We then went on in just under 22,000 patients to explore the thresholds with the high sense of troponin T after non-cardiac surgery in the relationship to 30-day mortality. And as you can see here, again, there's a very striking dose response as your high sense of troponin T increases after surgery, your probability of death dramatically increases. I'd be happy to explain how we did it, um, but basically using advanced statistical approaches, we demonstrated that the threshold for an elevated high sense of troponin T should be 20 or greater after non-cardiac surgery. This is Dr. Manuel Doucette, who did her PhD with me. She's an internist in Montreal, Canada. And Emmanuel then led us in a very important sub-study in vision where we measured um, the Abbott high sense of troponin I in over 5,000 patients prior to non-cardiac surgery. And then we looked to establish what should be the threshold for independent impact on major cardiovascular events within 30 days. And the threshold that Emmanuel established in this study is 60. So I believe all of, or most of you are using the Abbott high sensor trope I assay. Um, and what we'd recommend is in the setting of non-cardiac surgery, use a threshold of 60 or greater for defining who has myocardial injury that is prognostically relevant. This is Dr. Flavia Borges, who is an internist in our group. She's from Brazil. She did a postdoc with me and she has stayed in Canada in our group. And Flavia led us in a study that we undertook using the Siemens high sense of troponin I assay. And in this study of just over, or approximately again, just under 5,000 patients, Flavia demonstrated that the threshold for the Siemens high sense of trope assay should be 75 in the perioperative setting. This is to show you data just about 
the outcome of patients who have MINS compared to a group for which all people in cardiovascular medicine agree has a very poor prognosis, which is patients who've had a prior heart attack or known peripheral arterial disease, which is patients who participate in the COMPASS trial. So COMPASS was a large randomized control trial evaluating the effects of low dose rivaroxaban in patients who've had a prior heart attack or known peripheral arterial disease. MANAGE, I'll tell you more about in a moment, but MANAGE was a trial that we included patients who had MINS. And what is interesting about these data is looking at the control group in both of these trials. In COMPASS, the follow-up, the mean follow-up was 23 months, whereas in MANAGE, the mean follow-up was only 16 months. So if anything, the COMPASS patient should have had a much worse outcome because they had longer follow-up. What do we see, however? If we look at all-cause mortality, it's 4% in the COMPASS trial, 13% in the MANAGE trial. Cardiovascular death, 2% in the COMPASS trial, 7% in the MANAGE trial. Myocardial infarction, 2% in the COMPASS trial, 5% in the MANAGE trial. This just highlights to you that patients who suffer myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery are on a very poor trajectory. And because most people are not following these patients, they underappreciate how poorly they do, and they're doing much worse than a group of patients for which the cardiovascular community appropriately pays a lot of attention, which is people who've had a prior heart attack or peripheral arterial disease as participated in the COMPASS trial. So this raised the question of should you measure perioperative troponins? So as a first step, I don't hear anyone ever debate whether or not we really want to avoid missing myocardial infarctions. So in the POISE-1 trial, which was the first large randomized control trial that we undertook in this setting, which was comparing a beta blocker versus placebo, um, we had 190 centers in 23 countries. And in this trial of over 8,300 patients, we had 415 myocardial infarctions. Two thirds of these myocardial infarctions were asymptomatic, that is, the patient had an elevated troponin and ECG changes. Um, and then if you look at the risk associated with death at 30 days, the symptomatic myocardial infarctions, the hazard ratio is 4.75. But the asymptomatic myocardial infarctions, that is the troponin elevation with, T with, with ECG ischemic changes, the hazard ratio is four. In other words, asymptomatic myocardial infarctions are not benign. And if you don't measure troponins after surgery, you will miss two-thirds of the myocardial infarctions that are happening. And I can tell you from our experience in our hospital, because we've had a program, we've measured troponin perioperatively in at-risk patients for at least 15 years, you will find cases where patients will have troponins of 10,000 after surgery and not have symptoms and will be having very serious events. And if you don't measure troponins, you will miss these events. And the problem is even bigger than myocardial infarction because as I showed you a moment ago, in vision, MINS is much larger than myocardial infarction and 93% of the event, the MINS events in vision did not have symptoms of ischemia and would have gone unrecognized if we were not measuring troponins. And again, these asymptomatic troponin elevations are not benign. These patients are on a very poor trajectory. Now, if you're still not convinced that you would miss these events in your practice, I want you to consider the following case. And I'll share some cases even where things go wrong in our setting, just to highlight what can happen. So I was on call and it was at the end of a week, busy week of call. And um, a 67 year old lady, she ended up having a elective sacral vaginal plexi for a prolapsed uterus. It was a planned day surgery. So she was supposed to go home after her surgery. Um, that day I was on for cardiology and at, at, at this hospital, cardiology runs the perioperative vascular service. And we got consulted at 3.30 p.m. by the surgeon who would ask us to come take a look at her because the anesthesiologist was concerned that the patient had intraoperative hypertension and had a left bundle branch block. Um, when we arrived, we assessed the patient. The patient had no known cardiac or cerebral vascular disease, had a family history of stroke. Her parents and sister had both had all had strokes. And so she was taking aspirin for primary prevention. She didn't have a known history of hypertension, 
But certainly on this day of surgery, there's no ambiguity that she has hypertension. So she previously was well. She had good baseline functional capacity. She would go walking regularly. And with this activity, she never experienced chest discomfort or shortness of breath. She preoperative hypertension, as we stated, um, intraoperative blood pressure was 207 and 104. She was given IV esmolol and she had an estimated blood loss of 50 cc's. She had no chest pain and no shortness of breath when we were seeing her in the PACU. She was in no distress. Her blood pressure was 174 and 87. Her heart rate was 104 and regular. Her stats were 95% in room error. Her cardiac exam was unremarkable except for her blood pressure and heart rate. Her chest was clear and abdomen was also unremarkable other than tenderness in the lower abdomen. Her hemoglobin was normal. The leukocyte count was normal. Platelets were normal. Her creatinine was elevated at 127. We didn't have a prior creatinine, but this certainly raised concern for us that the patient may have had ongoing hypertension for a while that was unrecognized and some chronic kidney disease. She had a troponin I measure that was 17. Um, now the reference range is less than 10, but 17 is below the threshold that we would have for MINS in this setting. This was her ECG. So her ECG shows sinus rhythm, left bundle branch block, left axis deviation. We didn't have any other prior ECGs and we suspected this was probably a chronic old ECG finding. So we ended up giving the patient five milligrams of IV metoprolol. We ordered the repeat troponin. Her troponin came back at 13 and her blood pressure was substantially improved. The patient and the surgeon want to go home. And the question becomes is, what is your diagnosis and what would you do? I'm happy to open it up to see if anyone wants to offer any perspective on what they might do or what they think is going on with this patient. I'm also okay to go on if people are a little hesitant to offer their perspective, but we basically took the perspective that we thought she for certain had hypertension. She possibly had some mild chronic kidney disease. She likely had a chronic left bundle branch block. She was active with no history of ischemic symptoms. She had a borderline troponin, which was below our men's threshold, and then proved on the second measurement. So in terms of the management of this patient, we agreed to let the patient go home, but on the condition that she would fulfill a prescription for nitro spray, and she would follow our directions on how to use the nitro spray and when to go to the ER if she developed chest pain. Um, she would fill a prescription and start amlodipine five milligrams daily. She would resume her aspirin 81 milligrams daily, and she would come back to our outpatient clinic the following Monday. This was a Thursday that we were seeing the patient. So that's what we planned with the patient. What happened, so the patient went home, and later that night she developed chest pain and neck pressure. Now, based upon what we told her, she took her nitro spray, it improved, but it didn't resolve. And so then based upon this, she then went to the emergency room at another hospital in our city. So in our city, we have two main hospitals. And at that time, they had completely different electronic medical records. So you would not know about a patient at one hospital when they're at a different hospital. So this patient ends up coming to this other hospital where she didn't have surgery. And... Her troponin is now 1,385. The next morning she goes to cath. She has a left main distal 90% stenosis that extends into a long and complex stenosis in the circ. She has a long and complex 90% stenosis in the proximal LED with involvement of the D1 osteum. And she has an RCA which is dominant and she has a 50 to 70% proximal stenosis. Two days later, she has a cabbage. She has a leda that goes to her LAD and a savinus vein graft to her RCA, D1, and her CERC. Now, what's important about this case, just to highlight to people, is that you might think if MINS was such a big problem, you would see it and you would know. I just want to highlight that this woman who we saw postoperatively in a city where we have a big perioperative program 
because she went to another hospital, we didn't know what had happened to this woman. We only eventually found out what happened to this woman, and the surgeon who took care of her didn't know what happened to this woman. But we only eventually found out because the next Monday when she didn't arrive in the clinic, our admin assistant eventually was able to track her down a week later and discover that she had been admitted to the other hospital, had this heart attack, and had this surgery. So again, I think a problem that exists in perioperative care is that because most patients are not being followed, it's easy to assume patients do well when in fact they're not doing well. So based upon this, which patients should you measure preoperative troponins? You wanna target an at-risk group that's practical to implement with acceptable cost consequences. We published a paper from Vision looking at economic analyses where we measure troponins daily for three days after surgery in patients age 65 or greater or with a history of atherosclerotic disease. We focused on these two groups because that's simple to put into practice. In standardized orders, it can be a checkbox that the patient's age 65 or greater or under 65 with vascular disease, they're gonna get troponins done for the first three days after surgery. In terms of the cost um, impact of this monitoring strategy, when it comes to cost, it's always helpful to put it in the context of other things we do. And the cost of screening to avoid missing a MINS event is less than tenfold the cost of screening to avoid missing breast or cervical cancer, things that in most societies are readily screened for and should be. And this is just a highlight that if we're willing to screen for breast and cervical cancer, it seems odd that we would not be willing to screen for MINS given MINS is so much more cost efficient to screen for. And moreover, when you identify MINS, you're identifying people at risk of dying in the coming weeks. Whereas when you screen for breast and cervical cancer, you're usually identifying people at risk of dying in the next five years. So based upon this, we recommended to measure troponins in people over age 65 or known vascular disease. Um, consistent with what was said in the earlier talk, many guidelines and scientific statements have now endorsed and recommended screening perioperative troponins. The Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines were the first to do this in 2017, along with the Brazilian Society of Cardiology guidelines in 2017. The fourth universal definition of MI advocates to measure perioperative troponins in at-risk patients. Up-to-date makes the same recommendation. The scientific statement on the diagnosis and management of MINS from the American Heart Association in 2021 recommended to measure troponins in people aged 65 or greater or with known vascular disease. And most recently, the European Society of Cardiology 2022 guidelines recommended to measure troponins in people with known cardiovascular disease or risk factors like age 65 or greater. This just shows you the CCS, the Canadian Cardiovascular Recommendation to measure perioperative troponins, strong recommendation based on moderate quality evidence. And this is the 2022 ESC guidelines, again, advocating to measure. And in the ESC guidelines, they recommend to measure troponin before surgery and for the first two days after surgery in patients age 65 or greater or known cardiovascular disease. In their guidelines, they recommend that you measure again the troponin before surgery, first two days after surgery. And then if you have an elevation, you have perioperative myocardial injury, and then you want to identify the cause. So when you think about an elevated troponin detected in the perioperative setting, you first want to differentiate, is it a chronic troponin elevation or an acute troponin elevation? If you have a preoperative troponin, it's simple. You'll know whether or not it's dynamic. But if you only have a postoperative one, you just need to repeat it to see whether or not it's dynamic change. If it's an acute troponin elevation, this is perioperative myocardial infarction or injury. And then you want to break that down further. So is there evidence of a non-cardiac cause? sepsis, pulmonary embolism, bleeding, or is it due to a cardiac cause? And then in the cardiac causes, you wanna make a distinction between, is this due to ischemic coronary artery disease, so thrombus or supply demand mismatch, MINS, or is it due to a non-coronary artery disease like acute heart failure or a tachyarrhythmia? The reason you wanna make these distinctions is that the treatment will be different for each one of these categories. And just quickly to share two other cases that highlight points about this differentiation. 
This is a study where we are undertaking uh, advanced cardiac imaging ocular coherence tomography, and we took patients who would suffer MINS or a perioperative myocardial infarction, and then we took them to cath lab, and then we also took people who came to emerge with a typical myocardial infarction, and we took them to the cath lab and used the same technology. I'll tell you about two cases that were in the periop section. 64-year-old male, post-op day three after orthopedic surgery. The patient has no symptoms. We only know about this event because we were screening troponin. The troponin is 0.15 with, again, the upper limit of normal according to the lab being 0 0.04, but this is a high, this is a non-high sensor trope T. So the value should be 0 0.03 based upon the vision data. This is not a dramatically elevated troponin. And the patient had some anterior biphasic T wave. So like these weren't clearly abnormal T waves, but they're not normal. And the patient we take to the cath lab after their increased tropes. So the question to ask yourself is, do you think this will be due to thrombus or supply demand mismatch? Now, if you had have asked me up front, I would have said that this is more likely gonna be due to supply demand mismatch because it's not a very dramatically elevated troponin and there's not very dramatic ECG changes and there's no symptoms. This shows you the coronary angiogram in this patient. This is the proximal LAD. And on cath, we don't see thrombus, we infer thrombus. It's hazy, so you certainly wonder, could there be thrombus in this proximal LAD? This is showing you the ocular coherence tomography. So this is showing you the artery and longitudinal section at the bottom. And this is showing you the cross sections of the artery above it. This is the narrowing in the proximal LAD that I pointed out on the cath. And this is showing you what the artery looks like on the cross section. And you can see that there's this black rim, which is the endothelium behind this white mushy stuff. This white mushy stuff is thrombus. So this patient who didn't have a dramatically elevated troponin, no symptoms and some minor ECG changes had thrombus in their proximal LAD. Another case was an 83-year-old man, post-operative day five orthopedic surgery. This patient had chest pain and had a very dramatically elevated troponin of 9.85. No acute ECG changes. And two days after the trope increase, we did cardiac cath and OCT. And what do you think we'd find here? Now here I would have guessed it's more likely thrombus because this is a really big troponin elevation in this patient. This is showing you the patient's right coronary artery. And as you can see before this PDA takeoff, there's a very tight narrowing in the RCA. And this is showing you in longitudinal section, the OCT image. And you can see this is where the narrowing is. This is after a dilatation, but you can still see the narrowing. And you can see here the artery and cross section. And what you see is that this patient didn't have a thrombus, plaque fissure or rupture. This patient just had a severe stenosis in their distal RCA, and you're seeing it after a dilatation, um, but there was no plaque rupture thrombus, um, and this is a supply demand mismatch infarct. And the patient ends up getting PCI and did well. So what are your treatment options for MINS? So in POISE 1, we undertook regression analyses of patients who suffered MINS and looked to see which drugs looked protective for 30-day mortality. Two drugs stood out, aspirin and statins, showing benefits to reducing 30-day mortality in patients with MINS. A study from Alberta, which had a very large cohort of patients who had MINS, looked to see um, patients who received newly beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or statins, and demonstrated the patients who received these drugs had a substantial reduction in the probability of acute coronary syndrome or heart failure in the coming six months. We undertook the MANAGE trial, which we published in The Lancet in 2018. In this trial, we randomized patients who had MINS to dabigatran or placebo. We used an intermediate dose of dabigatran, 110 milligrams BID, and we demonstrated that dabigatran substantially reduced the risk of major vascular complications with a hazard ratio of 0.72, a result that is statistically significant. You see the curves immediately diverge, favoring dabigatran, continue to diverge till about a year then remain parallel. And even at two years, we don't see an obvious plateau in the curves, but the event rate in the placebo group is very high in terms of outcomes. So in conclusion, preoperative cardiovascular risk prediction has value. 
preoperative cardiac biomarkers strongly predict perioperative cardiovascular risk. Preoperative NT pro BMP, BMP is the preferred assay at present. Postoperative troponin monitoring is needed to avoid missing two thirds of perioperative MIs and greater than 90% of MINS events. And you should use the troponin thresholds established in the perioperative setting. And in patients who suffer MINS, physicians should consider initiating aspirin, ACE inhibitor, statin, beta blocker, and intermediate dose to bigger trend, 110 milligrams BID. And importantly, follow these patients up and do further risk stratification. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. PJ, for such uh, interesting information. So I noted some uh, message by your presentation, like there is a higher in risk of a uh, cardiac injury after non-cardiac surgery, even though it is asymptomatic, right? So we have to uh, use some biomarkers to predict whether it is really a means PMR or just to prevent uh, the by by knowing the population who is at risk. So before we jump to the next session, uh, which is discussion, I would like to ask question for two speakers. First, Dr. Septian, and the second for Dr. PJ. For Dr. Septian, uh, by your presentation, we know that we, we were late by waiting the symptom exists, then we treat the patient so that the outcome is uh, worse. There is a, if I'm not mistaken, it is a mortality rate around 75% for the case. So what can we learn from your study, Dr. Septian? Yes, thank you, Dr. Mayang. Yeah, just like uh, Dr. PJ said in, in his presentation that uh, actually we we have to move to the better better screening the, by by us. Uh, what is it? We check the cardiac troponin, uh, perioperatively, uh, preoperative, and then we following in uh, after uh, postoperatively in three day maybe. So uh, we can we 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 do not miss the 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 patient just like just like our patient because when when the uh, that's the the interesting thing about the uh, doctor PG cases the last cases the 85 years old there's a higher high in uh, cardiac troponin and there's a symptom but the ecg doesn't change it's in interesting for us because we usually uh, treat uh, the myocardial infarct by which we see in the uh, ecg first oh the ecg is okay so uh, maybe uh, there's no cardiac infarct just like that, but actually it's wrong because some uh, patient will uh, get the means and with the symptom, the cardiac troponin will be increased, but the ECG uh, do not change. So uh, what will we do? We, we, we will screen uh, better. We we check the cardiac troponin preoperatively, and then for 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 the patient with risk factor of uh, of course, just uh like hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and that vascular surgery, and etc. Uh, and then we following the cardiac troponin in three days postoperative. Maybe uh that's it, Doctor Mayang. Okay, thank you, Dr. Can, can, can I add a point to what was just said uh, by Sepian? Um, an important point that you're raising is that a lot of times people may have a false sense of security because they don't see dramatic ECG changes. And the thing that people should keep in mind is that because the vast majority of people don't have symptoms, because they're getting their ischemic event in the first 36 hours after anesthesia while they're on narcotics that can mask symptoms, you're only doing 
the ECG after you detect an elevated troponin. And that elevated troponin might be 10 or 20 hours after the ischemic event. So just imagine in your hospital today, or imagine, you know, two days ago in your hospital, a patient ended up having an open um, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. And the following morning, troponin is measured and it's normal. But let's imagine that's at 7 a.m. And let's imagine at 8 a.m., the patient actually starts to develop myocardial ischemia. And the patient, because they're getting narcotics, doesn't get any symptoms. The ECG is actually abnormal at 8 a.m., but none of us know because none of us are triggered to do an ECG because the patient's not complaining of symptoms and the troponin at 7 a.m. was normal. The next morning when you repeat the troponin, the troponin's now elevated, but you're now 23 hours after the ischemic event. And often the ECG is not normal, but it's not abnormal. And in fact, the most common ECG finding we see will be T-wave inversion a day or two after you detect the elevated troponin. And so some really important work that Giori Landoni had done in Israel where they did 12 lead um, Holter monitors, a lot of the patients who have troponin elevations have ECG changes. It's just that you miss it because you're not being triggered to do the ECG at the time of ischemia. You're only doing it when you detect the elevated troponin, which is frequently many hours after the ischemic event. Yeah. Uh, yes, you, you, you're right, Doc. But we, uh, of course, we cannot uh, check the halter monitor every time for every patient. It's like uh, you said that. So that I think the, the, the best way is by checking the cardiac troponin every day in three days uh, post-operatively. Maybe. Yeah. Or, or, or that, uh, can we wait the symptom? No, I think. Yeah, so I, I'm in total agreement. It's just more like it's not credible to do Holter monitors on everyone. That's just yeah. most hospitals don't have that capacity. Doing troponin is way cheaper and way more efficient and yeah. way more accurate. Yeah. It's just to make people realize why you don't see the ECG changes. Often there have been ECG changes. You just miss them. Yes. And so sometimes having people understand what happened makes them understand, okay, I shouldn't simply dismiss the troponin elevation without ECG changes because it doesn't mean that there wasn't ECG changes. You just missed them. So we're totally aligned. You should you should use troponin. It's a much more accurate, much more cost-effective test compared to Holter monitors. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Okay, for Dr. TJ, for the biomarkers itself, when is the best time we check it? Maybe several days before the surgery and several days after the surgery? Or yeah. where is the, the best time to check it? Yeah, so for certain, if you're going to measure it before surgery, just whenever the patient is in a pre-op clinic is when we would measure it, if we we're going to measure pre-op. Um, Post-operatively, we measure it sometime between 6 and 12 hours after surgery and the following morning and then day two after surgery. Um, obviously, there's some patients who are going to go home after day one. So you definitely want to make sure you get the troponin measured before they go home. Um, and, but I would not wait and say, I'm only going to measure on day two. I would measure, you know, six to 12 hours after surgery, day one after surgery, day two after surgery. And that gives you the best chance to avoid missing myocardial injury. Okay. Thank you. And it is, uh, should be checked for every patient or for certain patient with a certain yeah. comorbidities, so, for instance. Yeah, so I assume it's the same in Indonesia. The reality in Canada is that if you're being admitted to the hospital, it's going to be an intermediate to high-risk surgery. Low-risk surgery goes home and it's day surgery. So at an easy level, if they're being admitted to the hospital, um, you can consider that it's mo almost for certain it's intermediate to high-risk surgery. If they're age 65 or greater, we measure troponins. If they're under age 65 and they have known vascular disease, we will measure troponins. 
Again, you need something simple. Now in our center, because we measure NT pro BMP before surgery, if the NT pro BMP is elevated, then automatically we will measure troponins after surgery. So again, you want something that's simple enough that can get into practice. If it's a complicated scoring system, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that it's unlikely the average surgeon or the average anesthetist is gonna remember to look up the scoring system and then decide on measuring troponins. So age over 65 or under 65 with known vascular disease for in-hospital surgeries are people you should screen troponins on. Okay, thank you, Dr. PJ. And maybe some of the participants is uh, students. So what are your suggestions for the further research uh, according to your previous research? Yeah, so the, the next area is obviously that we have to go is to keep doing randomized control trials on how to manage people with MINS, and we'll keep doing randomized control trials on how to prevent MINS. So we most recently did POISE-3, where we tested tranexamic acid and blood pressure management strategies. Um, we're trying to get funding right now for POISE-4, which will be testing colchicine. We're doing a big trial on ivabradin, which is a drug that affects the eye funny channels of the heart that lowers heart rate but doesn't affect blood pressure so i think there's lots of very promising interventions for prevention but we also need to have trials on how do you manage the events when they happen and there's lots of novel therapies that we're very interested in studying in that setting but you know for anyone interested in getting involved with research you know look we're happy to talk at any time um, about potential research that we're doing if they want to get involved or just to discuss ideas that they have and offer a perspective on it. But, you know, the biggest thing is to get people measuring troponins and get these patients followed up because right now we're doing a disservice because many people are having important events that go unrecognized and then subsequently bad things happen. And it's from a society point of view, you know, if we're investing a lot of money to do surgery to cure cancer or to improve quality of life, it's a real shame if we miss and we don't identify myocardial injury and then the patient ends up dying three weeks or three months later from a cardiac event. Like that is a really sad missed opportunity and we can do better and we should do better. Thank you. Hopefully we can uh, have a joint research in the future. That would be wonderful. Okay. Yes. For our participants, actually, there are two questions here. The first one is, uh, maybe it's uh, for Dr. Septian. Uh, Dr. Septian, if RCR is score uh, more than two, then what should we do? Should we check troponin directly or not? So will be it advantages or not? Please, Dr. Septian. Thank you, Dr. Mayang. Uh, so, uh, there is no, uh, until now, uh, there is no journal that the uh, study about the RCRE and the cardiac troponin. But uh, as we know that patient with RCRE score uh, more than two, uh they will uh, be more probable to be to to get the means so it's better if you can check the cardiac troponin before for the patient especially for the patient with rcre more than two because uh you know that the RC, rcre also uh c5 the comorbidity the hypertension and the diabetes and so on so uh if the, the patient with RCRD score more than two, it means that it's, uh, they, they, they prob prob their probability to get means higher than the, the, the lower one. So uh, I think it's better if you check the uh, cardiac troponin preoperatively pre and then you can follow it postoperatively. And about the, the cost analysis, uh, Dr. PJ has uh, already published in the journal about the cost analysis and then 
the cost analysis actually not not uh, high but moderate but for us maybe in indonesian with the uh, national insurance uh, every single cardiac troponin check with bill will be cost in 160000 rupees uh, so i think uh, it's for that in a uh, job <laughs> to get uh, <laughs> To, to make some increase, policy. Yeah, increase the claim for the national insurance for every hospital. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Septian. So, Dr. PJ, actually in Indonesia, we have a limited fund due to our national uh, insurance coverage. And what do you think about that, Dr. PJ? How mm -hmm. can we make... Uh, or do you have any trick to overcome our problem? Well, a couple of things to think about. One is, I suspect it's probably pretty common that people measure hemoglobin in a CBC plus or minus creatinine a day or two after surgery. Um, certainly in North America and Europe, that would be pretty standard practice. I'm not against that, but it's just to make the point that screening and doing CBCs and creatinine um, its prognostication from death is way less relevant than actually myocardial injury. So the point is that a lot of times in medicine, we're spending a lot of money on a lot of things, which it's not that they're terrible, but if you just said we only have so much resource, is there something that is a much better utilization of that resource? And I would argue to you that if one said, I only have so much money, I would stop measuring hemoglobin and creatinine and I would measure troponin because it is so much more predictive. Um, the other thing too, certainly in Canada, um, there's throughout North America and even within Europe, um, a lot of time and money is spent on preoperative assessment. And again, I'm for preoperative assessment. I think it has value. But if one said, I only have so much money, I would put less money into preoperative care and I will put more money into postoperative care because that's when the complications are happening. So again, you know, ideally we do things in medicine all the time that new discoveries come along and, you know, you realize, wow, like we're really missing something that's important here and we need to start doing this. And so it happens all the time in medicine that new things just start getting done. People should put in context, troponin's not that expensive. So we're not talking about doing a brain MRI. We're not talking about doing angioplasty. Um, you know, we're talking about doing a troponin. And I would say to you, when you think about the cost of surgery and how much money is being spent on surgery to avoid missing myocardial injury that we can do something about just seems like a huge missed opportunity. So I would just advocate that, you know, people utilize all of those arguments and just think through in their own system, you know, how does one, if needed, reallocate the resources to measure troponin or just make the case that, look, this is a new standard of care. It's not that expensive. Um, but to not do it, I guess what I would ask is if, if uh, a health administrator told me I can't do it, I would tell them the evidence and tell them, do you want me not to do this for your mother? And if they really don't want me to do it for their mother, then fine. But I mean, I think most people rationally seeing the evidence would want it done for their mother. And if we should do it for my mother or their mother, we should do it for everyone's mother and father. Okay. Dr. Maya, uh, can I yes, translate, translate uh, about Dr. PG said to Bahasa? Because it's interesting, I think. <laughs> eh, please, please, Dr. Septian. <laughs> Uh, jadi dokter uh, PJ tadi ceritakan memang kita cukup mahalnya 160 ribu gitu. Tetapi kalau dilihat angkanya 160 ribu itu kayaknya gede. Tapi, hmm. tapi sebenarnya pemeriksaan AGD aja kita, kita yang rutin kita lakukan itu AGD 200 ribu gitu ya, 200 ribu. Dan itu sering kali kita lakukan. Dan kita tidak ada masalah dengan itu. Padahal yang AGD itu kita lihat bisa lihat dari saturasi mungkin uh, sudah cukup pakai saturasinya saja gitu ya. Tapi kita buang-buang uh, duit 
kenapa nggak kita cek yang astroponin yang memang uh, kita esensial ya, ini esensial nih orang mat, akan resiko mati mendadak gara-gara uh, kita nggak ngecek HS, uh, si troponin ini dibandingkan kalau ya kita cek uh, mungkin AGD elektrolit pasca operasi seperti itu yang rutin kita selalu lakukan mungkin seperti itu jadi uh, mungkin mindset kita kita harus berubah bahwa ini penting nih jadi ini kayak kalau kita ngecek uh, cek laktat gitu ya mungkin kita cek laktat ya ini mungkin salah satunya yang kita harus cek juga mungkin untuk untuk pasca operasi yang mungkin tadi ya special case yang memang SCRI atau mungkin dia yang dia ada resiko uh, di aterosklerosisnya dan usia geriatri mungkin itu thank you yeah. Dr. thank you dokter Setian but maybe before that we have to assure our policymaker by showing them some evidence like uh, how uh, how high the incidence of the means or the PMI we never know in Indonesia we never do the research maybe that's the first step that we should take maybe we can do a multi center research in Indonesia first yes and again for th sure that's, again it's it's very reasonable to do that but just the point I would make to you is that Vision had 40,000 patients internationally, 28 centers, 16 countries. It included Malaysia and India. Um, and although it's obvious Indonesia could be different than Malaysia and India and Hong Kong, I just think the probability is really low. So, like, I'm not against doing it. I think it's worthwhile to do it. But I do think, you know, you can also show the administrators the guidelines. The guidelines are now saying you should do this. It's not just someone's opinion, um, but for sure, doing research gets people comfortable with things, gets them exposed to it. But if you do do research and you show that you don't see MINS, please let me know because that will be a miraculous <laughs> finding. Um, I do not think you're going to find you don't see MINS. Okay, thank you, Dr. PJ. Yes, that's right. Because doing some research will be, uh, what is it? Let, we need time to do some research, right? Yeah, it gets people so experience. Yes, why don't we use the guideline that already established by some uh, multi countries or multinational? Yes, I can get that point. Uh, and also, we have next question for Dr. PJ, I think. In case of means, Dr. PJ, which biomarker bio that we check? It is a high sensitivity, sensitive troponin I or troponin T. Yeah. So whatever your whatever your hospital uses. So um, importantly, we've established the thresholds with the high sensitrope T, with the Abbott high sensitrope I, and with the Siemens high sensitrope I. So whatever assay your hospital is using, that's what you should use. It's not it's not a simple thing that. I can't tell my lab, hey, tomorrow I'll start using, you know, this other assay. It's a big deal to change assays um, and you don't need to change assays. Um, uh, but whatever your hospital is using is fine. And um, for those of you, I think a lot of you are using the Abbott high sensitrope I, you should use a threshold of 60 after surgery as being the threshold for men's. Okay, thank you. So... Is it used also to screen the patient to have means in the future? For sure, like we're advocating and the guidelines are advocating that you should be screening patients for MINS. The reason being, again, most MINS events happen when people are post-anesthetic getting narcotics. And if you don't measure troponins, you'll miss these prognostically important myocardial injuries. And as I showed you, like there's cases I've personally managed where the high sensor component is 10,000 and the patient didn't have any symptoms. So there's some patients are having big events. And if you don't measure troponins, you will miss those events. And that's very unfortunate. Okay. Thank you for, I, uh, I think we have our last question. It is maybe for Dr. Septian. Dr. Septian. Um, okay. Is there just, any... Can I, can, I, can, I, can I make just one other point? 
that yeah, maybe yeah, will help solidify yeah. things. Is it fair in Indonesia, patients age 65 or greater or under 65 with vascular disease, would you commonly do an ECG before surgery? Yes. Okay. Sure. My point is, I, I, I think that's a good idea. I'm not against that. But again, from a money point of view, if I said, okay, I only have so much money, you'd be better off to put that money in a troponin. But just to make the point to you, when you do that ECG preoperatively, if the patient is in rapid atrial fibrillation, there's many patients who are in rapid atrial fibrillation who don't, they don't feel it. If you found rapid atrial fibrillation, you would do something about it and you would likely consult medicine, cardiology, whoever it was. It's the same point about troponin. In other words, if you're used to and you see value in doing preoperative ECG, which I agree, I think it has value. And every now and then you're going to pick up someone who has rapid atrial fibrillation that's unknown as an example, or a left bundle branch block or something else that's important. Um, you would manage it. The same is true about just doing troponin after surgery is that you're going to pick up people that are having important myocardial injury that you wouldn't know about. And yet they're on a bad trajectory and we should do something about it. Okay, such a nice information that the troponin is uh, as important as the ECG that we usually do, it, yes? It is more important. It is more not important. important. <laughs> not as important. Okay, such a new information for us, Dr. PJ. Uh, nice to know that. Also, we have to jump to our last question. It is about the, the relationship between the anesthetic technique, both general or regional, with the means. What do you think, Dr. Septian? Is it a, has association or not? Uh, for, thank you, Dr. Maya. For SCRE, uh... There is no uh what they say point that that uh screening about the what is the type of anesthesia. So uh in this uh revised cardiac risk that uh they they did not uh difference uh between uh okay. anesthesia and regional anesthesia. Technics. So it's for all the patient preoperatively, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, I get the point, Dr. Septian. So apparently we we already arrived to our final uh, session. So before that, uh, before I close the session, I would like to invite Dr. Septian and also Dr. PJ to give some short closing remarks about uh, the two materials. Please, Dr. Septian first, maybe. Mute, Dr. Septian. Can I uh, say it in Indonesia? Yes, silakan, Dr. Uh, cardiac troponin itu lebih penting daripada EKG dalam meng, uh, memprediksi terjadinya neokardiak infak yang bisa terjadi pada pasien pasca operasi kita. Meskipun, dan yang menarik adalah kenaikan yang mild cardiac troponin itu banyak yang kemudian terjadi mins dan apalagi di era hospital uh, by law sekarang ini bisa membantu kita mungkin terima kasih oke okay. terima kasih dokter septian how about dokter pj please give us some closing remarks um i would just say to you that there's now overwhelming evidence that if you don't measure troponins after surgery in people age 65 or greater or known vascular disease, you will miss 90% of the prognostically important myocardial injuries. You will miss two thirds of the myocardial infarctions in these patients. And you know we owe it to our patients to do better than that. I would make the analogy, it'd be the same as Obviously, when you're doing anesthesia in Indonesia, I'm sure the patient has an auction SAT probe on. I am sure that you're carefully monitoring, you know, um, their blood pressure and their heart rate. It'd be the same as 
removing the oxygen saturation probe and not measuring the blood pressure or the heart rate during the entire you know, surgical case. It doesn't make any sense. You're making your patient very vulnerable for a bad outcome. And I just think the evidence is now overwhelming that this is happening. It's happening because we're doing surgery in older patients who have more vascular disease. And the good news is we have a cheap, simple test that can allow us to detect this. And we owe it to our patients to do that and to then manage them better and to do better research to figure out how we're gonna prevent it more, better and how we're gonna manage it better. But the first step is identifying it and not just ignoring it. Okay, thank you, Dr. PJ, for the concise uh, closing statement. So let me um, read what I can point from the presentation that the incidence of BINS and PMI for patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery is uh, truly real. So to prevent it and also manage it, we have to find what uh, population who are at the higher risk by using biomarkers. And the biomarkers ILSEP, uh, namely anti pro BNP and high sensitivity trop I or trop T. And by using this, we can predict and also manage the event and also the risk postoperatively. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all the speakers, Dr. Septian and also Dr. PJ for the informative, for the interesting, interesting presentation and also for our sponsor, Abbott uh, Product Indonesia, um, Maya and team, and also for our uh, lovely participant. Please give applause for the speakers and for you all. Thank you so much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you on the next live Perdatin webinar. Yeah. Terima kasih. Dr. Septian. Thank you, Dr. PJ. Thank you, Dr. PJ, Dr. Septian, Dr. Maya. See you next time. Terima kasih untuk belasnya. Pleasure to meet you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Halo. Lalu bicara ini dari Singapura sana. Jadi, dia hubungan linknya ya. Makanya sekarang lebih Oke, terima kasih Dokter Mayang. Sampai ketemu lagi di webinar kita selanjutnya ya, Dok. Gitu ya. Bu Maya, terima kasih Bu Maya. Terima kasih Pak Supan. Ya, Bu Mayang. Udah ya, Pak? Udah, Mbak Mewar. Izin okay. leave, Pak Soban. Yeah. Oke, okay, silakan. Iya, uh, Dr. Mewar. Iya, dok. Sehat-sehat, Mbak Mewar. Iya. So yeah.